Hello everyone. I was in town about five or six weeks ago, uh, wandering around an area of Plymouth called the Barbican, which is um, a lovely place. Uh, it's one of the few areas of Plymouth that wasn't destroyed during the Second World War. Um, and I stumbled across an old bookshop, um, and I've lived in Plymouth since 1988 and didn't know this bookshop existed and um, I went in just I didn't have much time I only had a very quick look around but um, one of the things that I was interesting in obtaining was a book on Dartmoor um, by someone uh, by the name of Hemery it's called um, High Dartmoor and um, I asked. I couldn't see it on the shop, on the shop, on the shelves. Um, the the, uh, the guy had a kind of extensive section just um, dedicated to Dartmoor books alone, and he recognised the title immediately, and told me he did have a copy of the book, um, but unfortunately, it was hidden behind a massive um, pile of books that he just had. Um, in and it was impossible to get to uh, but he said he was going to fish it out and uh, put it on the shelves and it would be available if I came back at a later date. Um, coincidentally the very next week I went for a walk up on Dartmoor with my regular walking companion and uh, he said to me you'll never guess what but I've found a really interesting bookshop in Plymouth and he too like me he's lived in Plymouth longer than I have and he had found in the same week this very same bookshop and um, he too had uh, asked whether they had a copy of Hemery and received the same answer um, so that was a strange coincidence in its own right. He had had more time to look around this shop and he was telling me about it. And it really is the most extraordinary place. Um, it's, as I say, it's in a very old part of uh, Plymouth. I've got a, um, I've got their, their business card here. I don't know whether that's a photograph of the shop front. And you can see it's like something out of Harry Potter, very old brickwork there. I don't quite know whether that's 17th century maybe even, or 18th century, the building. Um, but that shop, it's on three levels. There's a ground floor, an upper floor, and I presume the other floor is actually in the attic. Um, but uh, I had a better chance, I went back today and had a better chance of um, opportunity to look around the whole place. And it was just incredible. Um, I asked for the copy of Hemery again, and he laughed because the pile of books in, that's blocking his access to it has grown rather than diminished. So he still hasn't managed to um, fish it out. But this place is, it's like the bookshop that time forgot. Um, He's not computerised in any way. He, he's got a warehouse somewhere outside of town. I don't know whether he sells books from there on eBay. But he doesn't have a web store. Um, he doesn't appear to have a great many customers. It's, it's a very odd place. I, I, when I was there today, admittedly it's midweek, but um, there, were, there was himself and a lady behind the counter um, and there was myself as a customer and two other people who were together in the entire entire shop so the staff nearly outnumbered the the customers um, the whole place is a complete jumble of books um, it, it's organized in a kind of very chaotic fashion that that you all be aware that there's a section of books related to history, to military history, to geography or whatever, but there's no attempt to organise the books 
in, a, in any kind of uh, systematic way. Um, so if, you want, if you're looking for a particular book, you either have to ask him, and he may be the shop owner, and he may be aware that he's got a copy and tell you where it is, or else you'll just have to browse through stacks and stacks of books. There are books piled on the floor, there are books out of reach on the upper shelves, um, and it's the most incredible experience to go through it. And it, it struck me as I was going through that um, bookshops like that aren't going to survive and it's a great pity um, we're losing we're losing something and we're losing a way of um, regarding the the past of of researching material um, all kinds of things like that because if you take the example of the hemery if i were to go to the internet um, and the internet is going to replace shops like that. There's no way that he can, his shop, although it has survived for decades there without my knowing, um, he must have to pay a huge rent on, on the property. Um, it's not in a particularly busy commercially part of Plymouth, but it is in a, a fairly um, uh, exclusive area. It's an area where you get lots of Shop, not shoppers, but tourists, passers-by, um, all that kind of thing. Um, it's probably not the right place for a bookshop. Um, and most shops like that just pack up and start selling online. Um, and then he's not, I don't think he's going to do that. He's just not, they don't, the, the couple, if they are a couple, don't appear to have any interest in um, organising or cataloguing their collection of books um, other than what they, they know from memory. Um, it's just, I, I, I mean, you can tell from probably from the way I'm just searching for words here that the whole place is absolutely bewildering and as you walk around it um, you just get completely, your eyes glaze over at the number of books that um, are in there and titles that that grab your attention and take your interest and you want to buy. And you'll never get that experience on the internet. Um, if you take the example of Henry, if I wanted to buy a copy of Henry on the internet, I would Google it, I would look it up on eBay, I would search for the title. Um, I came away from that bookshop today having spent over £70 on books. And they're all purchases that I made simply because I stumbled across the books in the shop, um, it would never have occurred to me to search for those titles online. And the shop is going to disappear, the books will end up as debris somewhere, they might not even get sold as books, they might get burned, they might get destroyed eventually. Um, and that part of our past, that part of our the way we the way we read books, the, the tangible um, effect of the books on us, rather the smell of them, it's all disappearing. Everything is being digitised. Our, our searches for them are being digitised, and the material itself, the documents, are, are being digitised, and the the past is disappearing before our eyes. Um, but I wanted to show you the books that I bought and just um, show you those, show you the, the delights that you can find in this shop. So I'll just switch the camera off and then um, come back to you in a moment. Right, so on the first occasion that I went to the shop um, and I just had just discovered it, um, I couldn't get hold of the hammery, but um, the guy behind the counter pointed this book out to me, which is one of the classic guides to Dartmoor. Um, it's by a guy called Crossing. Um, this is a reprint of the 1912 edition. Um, so it's written a long time ago. Um, but there are three standard texts on Dartmoor, really. One is the Hemery that I couldn't get hold of. Another one is uh, by a chap called Worth, which I already have. And Worth deals mainly with um, the historic evidence that there is on Dartmoor, the, 
stone rows and circles and that kind of thing. Crossing's book is more to do with the routes, the tracks and trails and old um, workers' routes and uh, cattle drives and that kind of thing. So it's more a guide to getting around on Dartmoor. Um, it's long since been surpassed, I suppose you'd say. Um, it's not a it's not a walking book in in the same way as uh, if you bought a guide to Dartmoor nowadays, where you would get suggested walks, circular walks of such and such a distance. This is more to do with how to find your way around the, the moor, what trails to use. So it's a s classic text um, that any enthusiast of, uh, of Dartmoor should have, really. I didn't have it. Um, unlike some of the other books that uh, I'm going to show you, though, that I bought in this shop, this one, had I been making my purchases on the internet, I almost certainly would have been directed towards this book, having searched for the other one, for Hemery. So, obtaining this book in a bookshop isn't really any different than what my internet experience would be had I gone to the, the web. Um, however, this book probably is. This is... Um, uh, this is one of a series of books published by Longman back in the 1980s and I wouldn't imagine that you could get hold of this book nowadays other than secondhand or on eBay possibly. Um, but you certainly wouldn't be pointed in the direction of this book on the internet if you were looking for books on Dartmoor for instance. So. Um, what I'm trying to say is that the buying experience really um, is altered now that we buy books on the internet. The only way you're going to really find this book is by coming across it by chance in a bookshop like the one I visited. Um, and in itself, it's I'm going to use it as a reference book really. It deals with the Southwest, the history of the Southwest. Um, from prehistoric times right up until AD 1000. So it covers the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, um, the Roman Conquest and the Saxon period, really. Um, it won't be a riveting read, as I say, I'm going to use it for reference mainly. Um, but it's packed full of uh, information, maps of archaeological sites, um, all kinds of things like that, Woodbury Castle. Um, so it's the kind of book I like to own. Um, you can find out lots of things on Wikipedia, but even, even with um, the vast amount of material that you can now find on Wikipedia, there are probably th still things in this book that you don't, you wouldn't find there. Um, and I just like to own this kind of thing. So that's what I'm trying to say about how our kind of knowledge of the past is being shaped really by our use of digital technology. The, the good old fashioned way of going to a bookshop and just seeing what you can find is disappearing. Um, and then on that previous occasion, another book I bought completely unrelated to the previous two now. I just noticed this on the shelf and thought I would get it. Uh, it's um, an American publication, 1960s, Paris in the Terror, some, June 1793 to July 1794. Um, and it's basically the story of the Terror. Um, it's, a, it's a period of history that's always interested me. Um, you tend to find history books of this type and written in this period are a lot more accessible. They're not quite so academic, they're written in a more um, prosaic fashion, um, so they make a good read. So I'll definitely get around to reading this one from cover to cover. Um, 
And again, if I was shopping on the internet, there's no way that would have been thrown up. Even if this was available for sale on the internet, I must Google it at some stage or look on eBay. Very unlikely that you'd find it on the internet. Um, and you certainly wouldn't have it um, suggested to you based on your previous search for Emery's High Dartmoor. Right, so the, today I went back to the shop Still couldn't get hold of Hemery, but um, he, I know he wants £80 for the Hemery, so I took quite a lot of cash with me. And I ended up exploring all three floors of the shop and came away with a whole mix of various things. First book I saw that uh, brought back memories was this one here, Alan Moorhead's The Blue Nile. Now, Alan Moorhead wrote a number of... Um, history stroke travel books in the 1960s. Um, his most famous book was a book called The White Nile, which was the story of the search for the source of the Nile. Um, and I was aware of the book as a schoolboy, but I only got round to reading it in 1983. And I was actually in Egypt um, and hired a, a felucca when I was in Luxor and I hired a Fluka and uh, two crew and we sailed um, down the Nile from Luxor to a place called Esna. Um, no, it was actually further than that. We went through Esna and I eventually um, disembarked at a place called Edfu, which is quite close to Aswan. And while I was enjoying this uh, leisurely cruise down the Nile on, in splendid isolation. <laughs> Myself and the hordes of mosquitoes, I read The White Nile. And um, this is the second book on a similar subject. This is The Blue Nile by Alan Moorhead, um, which is the story of the Blue Nile, which is the half of the Nile that stems from Ethiopia. So um, looking forward to reading that. And it brought back a lot of memories as well of um, my school days and that trip to Egypt. Um, next book I saw, which um, again I bought simply because it brought back memories, was The Black Hole of Calcutta, a reconstruction by Noel Barber. Now, I distinctly remember reading this book because it was on the shelves of my school library. Um, it's not the sort of subject matter that you would probably see a book written about nowadays. Um, the Black Hole at Calcutta was a very unfortunate incident that happened in the middle of the 18th century um, when a number of the residents of Calcutta were imprisoned in a small room in the fortress when the city had been captured by the local native ruler, Siraj Dawa and they were left overnight in very cramped and congested conditions and a great many of them asphyxiated. Um, but the Black Hole of Calcutta has really been used as an excuse by apologists for the empire um, as a reason why the British then um, Clive of India then defeated Suraj Dawla at the Battle of Plassey and um, the East India Company took control of Bengal. And um, it, when this book was written as well, which was probably in the 1960s, if I read it in the 1960s, August 1966 it says there, Yeah, 1966. Um, Britain in those days was still kind of um, bemoaning the loss of empire, and there was a kind of counter trend, really, I think you could say, where a great many of the tragedies that were occurring in ex um, empire uh, countries were blamed, I think, on the um, 
loss of British control over them. Um, I'm trying to put this in a polite way, uh, but basically there was still a lot of bigotry, jingoism, um, a disbelief that African and Indian, Asian countries could rule themselves um, without um, warfare, and without political corruption and so on. Um, so it was, it's a very, it's, it's, it's a book that's not been written for um, good reasons really. But all the same, it is a sort of fascinating, it is a fascinating read, an interesting read, um, but not something you will see nowadays. And I think, if I remember rightly, Noel Barber, the author, I don't know if it's going to say anything about him on the sleeve cover. I don't think it does. But I think Noel Barber was the brother of Anthony Barber, who was um, Chancellor of the Exchequer under Ted Heath. I might be wrong in that, but if memory serves me correct, that's right. Uh, next book I've got, as you probably know, um, I am... Uh, Great fan of the new set of oars by Studio Tomahawk, uh, Tomahawk called Congo. And I noticed this book on the shelf. Um, it's a book just called The River Congo. Uh, I bought it on spec, really. When was it written? So it's a story of the discovery, explore, exploration and exploitation of the world's most dramatic river. And that final word there, exploitation, um, has a lot of connotations because there are a great many atrocities committed by the Belgians in the Congo. So exploitation in the extre extreme meaning of the word. This was first written in 1978. Um, but it's going to have a lot of interest. I think it'd be a way of getting into the history of, um, of that area of Africa. So it will just supplement my new interest in the period um, while I'm playing the new war game. Uh, right, the next things, I'll show, I think I'll show this to you in the order that I found them. This is the sort of thing I love. This is an Ordnance Survey map of Britain in the Dark Ages. And I noticed on the inner cover um, that it once belonged to Plymouth Education Committee Crown Hall, Crown Hill Secondary Modern School. I don't think that school will exist. I live quite near Crown Hill, and I'm not familiar with a Crown Hill Secondary Modern School. Um, but it, as I say, it's reference only. It's reference purposes only. But it's the sort of thing I love. It's a pull-out map of so whether it be the whole of the British Isles or just. England alone. I'm not going to be able to show it to you all on the on the screen. Uh, yeah, it goes right up to the north of Scotland, and it's all the Dark Age sites um, that they were aware of in 1966 when they made this map. So I just, as I say, I just like that little thing. Just have a quick look to see if I can find Sutton Hoo on it. Sutton Hoo's got to be here. Rendlesham. Sutton Hoo. There's Sutton Hoo there. Um, not so much down in my neck of the woods. There's a few bits and pieces, but anyway, I like this sort of thing. And then on a similar, next to it, on a similar theme, is the Ordnance Survey map of Southern Britain in the Iron Age. Um, and there are certainly a lot of Iron Age forts around here. By southern Britain, what do they mean? Well, it goes all the way up to 
the Lake District and beyond. So I think they mean, by Southern Britain, they mean England. And of course, in the Iron Age, England didn't exist because um, England takes its name from the Angles who didn't arrive until after the Romans left, which is after the Iron Age. So I think that's why they described it as Southern Britain. Uh, yeah, but there's a lot more. All the, all the local Iron Age forts and things are marked on here. Um, so it's just a useful aid if you want to visit sites locally. There's all the stuff down on the tip of Cornwall. Absolutely peppered with sites down there. Anyway, enough of that. And this is still, I'm still on the ground floor of this shop. There are another two, two floors to explore. Um, there was another history section upstairs and I found this. Now, you might think this is a bit tacky if you're a serious academic, um, but it is very hard to get hold of a copy of the Doomsday Book. Now, this book has been kind of dumbed down in a way um, because they have... Uh, Put in lots of photographs and so on, um, so it's not it's not the layout of the original book by any means. Um, but I think that's quite a ni nice presentation of the entries in the Doomsday Book, which was written in the 1080s. Um, so this is again, it's just for reference, um, not the sort of thing that you come across very often. Don't know when it was, it looks like it's sort of like 1980s this. Uh, oh no, 1990s, so even more recent than that. Um, but it's the sort of thing I like and it's gonna go and sit on my bookshelves and I will refer to it once in the blue moon. Similarly with this, this is a similar kind of book, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. Um, they're not, I did read the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles when I was at university. They're not the, um, not the most riveting of read, but this has been tarted up with lots of commentary and photographs, as you can see. Um, so it's quite a nice little History book on the Saxon on Saxon England. Um, so I was quite pleased to get hold of this, and um, I was kind of getting aware. As, as I say, my eyes were glazing over because everywhere I looked in this bookshop, there were books everywhere, piled higgledy piggledy and on the shelves, and I, I could have bought half the shop, and I was aware I was running out of money. Um, and they had an entire room put aside for military history and I didn't buy anything in that room because I went to it last and I was aware that my wallet was beginning to um, suffer. But if you were a war gamer, that room in its own right would be worth a visit to Plymouth um, because they had such a wealth of material in there, um, histories of warfare, but also books on um, uniforms and costumes and so on, weapons. Um, a lot of it, you do, a lot of, a lot of military history um, that you see is junk and that was reflected in what they had on their shelves. But at the same time, there was a lot of little treasures in there and a lot of things that were just unique in their own right. Um, they had quite a lot of old Osprey books. Um, they were all selling for about £10 each, which isn't bad. They're not, it's not cheap, but it's not a bad price to pay for some of them. Um, so they had quite a large collection of Osprey books. They had one book which was... Um, 
it was written in the 1960s and it was just a compendium of military law as it's as it um, stood in the 1960s so it was really a book that would only been it would have been of reference use for military lawyers um, so quite a unique historical document really um, and it was just lying there on the shelves amidst all the other stuff they had there but they had they had some really good books and I'd spent all my money so probably the next time I the next time I go back and have another go at trying to get hold of Henry I will um, I will have a better look around that that area there but basically the mess what I'm trying to say the message I'm trying to say is that this is a thing of the past now these bookshops are, are disappearing and no matter how much the internet has benefited us wikipedia has benefited us we are still losing something there's something disappearing that we're not going to get back we're not going to get back that physical reminder of my own my own past from my own school days we're not going to get back the opportunity to jump from Dartmoor to Anglo-Saxon Britain to the Doomsday Book. The internet just doesn't skip around like that. No matter how much you surf it, the surfing takes you in a certain direction and it takes you in a certain trend. Um, and we're not going to get, we're not going to keep the kind of bricks and mortar I mean that shop as I say the shop in itself is a is a, a building that's sort of so full of character it's got that sort of dusty bookish smell it's got dust and it's probably got mice and spiders and it's just like a really it, it's that it was a real step back into history just to walk into the shop alone um, and it's all disappearing. It'll be gone in another 20 years. So there we are. That's just my reflections on a day out shopping in Plymouth. Um, thanks very much for watching, putting up with my usual waffle. And I'll see you on the next video. Bye for now.